naked. The Hebrew word arom, uh, rendered naked in the King James Version Bible, uh, has several meanings. It can mean absolute nakedness, such as we would think of in the flesh in some passages in the Bible. However, in other places, it means one who is uh, raggedly or poorly dressed. Another meaning of the word naked can mean someone who has removed their outer garment and retains their inner or undergarment, uh, such as Saul in the book of Samuel when it states that Saul laid down naked. Uh, he had uh, simply removed his outer garment. The same with Isaiah when it states in the book of Isaiah that he walked about naked and barefoot. He wasn't absolutely naked. He was, had removed his outer garment. The word naked is also utilized metaphorically to signify to put to shame or stripped of resources, or in a military sense, it can even mean disarmed. Nakedness also signifies sin or folly, and it is put for idolatry in particular. Let's begin our study with an example in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is written to the man under the sun. And this is an example of arom, the Hebrew word uh, meaning complete, absolute flesh nakedness. Let's pick it up, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, again written uh, to the man under the sun, meaning we in the flesh. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, we ask that word of wisdom as always in Yeshua's precious name, Father, open eyes, open ears. Keep thy foot, in other words, watch your step, don't slip up, when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear and this word means to hear with understanding, than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not what they do evil. They're not taught uh, any better than to do wrong. Verse 2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. Now, one verse Charlie's could learn from this verse. Uh, they let the words of God be few and that they teach one verse and then they talk about it for 40 or 45 minutes. And uh, it's, you know, it's God's word that's important and should be taught, not man's word. Verse three, for a dream or, or realizing a dream cometh through the multitude of business, through work, in other words. And a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. Chatter, constantly chattering and never really saying anything. What this verse is saying is if you want to accomplish something, if you want a dream to be realized, work toward it. Don't talk about it. Have you ever known someone who talks a mean game? They, I'm going to do this and we're going to do that and I'm going to do this and we're going to do that. And all they do is talk about it. They never get around to accomplishing the, the goal. Verse 4, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools, pay that, in, in fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. And it's actually best not to make vows to God. In, in verse 2, remember it says, Be not hasty to utter anything before God. To me, that, that, how many people do you know who would try and gain favor from God by promising Him something? You, know, you don't need to promise God anything. He owns everything. What can you give God that He needs? Nothing except your love. I'll, I'll, I'll state that. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, we'll, we'll back that up. But when it comes to making vows, be slow. Think, think about it. Think it through before you just try and gain favor from God by saying, well, God, if you'll do this for me, and we're, we're not necessarily talking about money. You know, people make vows that I will do this if you will do that, God. And, but if you make a vow to him, be very careful that you keep that vow. Verse 5, better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Verse 6, 
Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel, the angel of the Lord, in other words, God himself, that it was an error. That, that vow I made was a mistake, Lord. I take it back. Don't do that. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice, your excuses, and destroy the work of thine hands? The Lord giveth, the Lord can certainly taketh away. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also divers vanities. This means emptiness or, or nonsense. But fear thou God. This word fear, as you know, has two meanings. It can mean actual fear. In this case, it means revere. And what do we learn in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7? Fear of the Lord or reverence of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, all wisdom. But fools despise instruction. Verse 8. If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment, and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. Don't, don't be surprised that there are injustices. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth. And who is the highest? Of course, that's our Heavenly Father. He sees what people do to other people and he considers it. For he that is higher, well, did I miss there? No, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth and there be higher than they. Everyone has a boss. Spiritually, though, God is the highest. You can serve no higher. Verse 9, Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. The king eats the same wheat that you eat, that goes from the field to make the bread, is what this is saying. All are served by the, the profit or the increase. The, the harvest of the earth is for all. He that loveth silver shall be not satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance or wealth with increase. This is also vanity. If you're so absorbed with money and you love money, this is saying you'll never have enough money to be satisfied. You'll never have peace of mind. And you know, it's better to have a little and be happy than it is to have a lot and be in constant turmoil, worrying about who's gonna try and take the wealth from me. How can I get some more money? And, and, and that's, that's vanity, it's emptiness, it's nothing. That, if that is all you have in your life, I feel sorry for you. I really, really do. There is no peace of mind, no happiness to those who love money. Verse 11. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And this is the man who is, loves money. And what this is saying is when he builds his wealth, he has a lot of temporary friends, volunteers, that are willing to party with him until the wealth is gone. But when the wealth is gone, it's kind of like uh, the, uh, the, the prodigal son. You remember he went out and he took his inheritance and he blew it. And he had lots of friends while he was blowing his money. But then when the money was gone, where were the friends? They were also gone. And what good is there to the owners thereof, the, the rich man, in other words, saving the beholding of them with their eyes. In other words, seeing the people enjoy the prophets. Verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Someone who works hard is tired at night, and they get a good night's sleep. Whether he eat little or much, but the abundance or overindulgence of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. He lays awake all night worrying who's going to try and steal his wealth. How can he get more wealth? On and on. Abundance does not bring, overindulgence does not bring a good night's sleep. 
There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun. This book, Ecclesiastes, written to the man in the flesh, under the sun. Namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Don't, doesn't do anybody any good. Verse 14, but those riches perish by evil travail. You know, how many times do you read about someone who's very successful in business? But then they just make one false move in the business world and they lose everything. One unlucky venture can wipe out his entire fortune is what this verse is saying. And he begetteth a son and there is nothing in his hand. He has nothing to leave in as an inheritance to his children because he lost it all in a risky venture. Verse 15, the reason we came here. As he came forth of his mother's womb naked, Arom in the Hebrew, shall he return to go as he came and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. I don't care how much money you have, how much silver you amass in the life. You can't take it with you when you die. You came into this world naked and naked you will go out. Uh, Job said the th same thing in chapter 1 of the book of Job. After he had lost everything, his children, his wealth, his f friends, everything that he lost. He said, naked came I into the world and naked I will go out. And you know what? Uh, when in, in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, we learn there that all of us are naked before God. Can anyone argue with that fact? When you die, you are naked before God. In fact, you don't even have to die to be naked before Him. You're naked before Him now, as it states there in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. And that simply means that you can't hide anything from God. He can look into your inner being, your inner self. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. You can't take wealth with you. We learn in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, the only thing you can take with you is your works, whether good, bad, or ugly. Your works do go with you. Verse 16, And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind, chasing the wind constantly, uh, wanting to earn more. And the, the ironic thing about it is you can't take it with you. So uh, if you spend your whole life chasing the wind, chasing this venture, chasing that venture, trying to amass more wealth, it's, and, and you don't have any happiness, what's the point? You can't take it with you. Verse 17, all his days also he eateth in darkness or gloom, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness, vexation of spirit. Verse 18, Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him. Who gives him? God giveth him, for it is his portion. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of your labors. Just don't become obsessed with earning more and more and more wealth to the point that you're never, ever satisfied. You're never happy. But all are gifts from God. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God. God blesses those who serve him. And you don't have to wait for your reward till you die. He blesses those that serve him. We learn how to serve him here in his word. Verse 20. For he shall not much remember the days of his life. Moffat translates this, the fewness of his days, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. To enjoy the riches which are a gift from God, you have to serve him. Not, 
serve yourself by ever wanting more and more and more and never being satisfied. There's a good example in the book of Ezekiel concerning uh, spiritual idolatry being referred to as nakedness. Turn with me to Ezekiel. Oh, let's go chapter 23. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Now, who is this the word of? Is this the word of Reverend Smith or Pastor Jones? No, this is the word of God came to Ezekiel. Son of man, there are two women, the daughters of one mother. And we're going to learn that the two women are Israel and Judah. And, of course, they're the daughters of one woman who is the woman Eve, of course. The, the Bible is a history of one seed line, that of Adam and Eve and the people that came in contact with them. Verse 3, And they committed whoredoms in Egypt, the two daughters did. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed, and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. Well, I didn't think there was such language as that in the Bible. That's the problem. You're not reading the Bible because there is such language as that in the Bible. And, but the, don't think flesh here. Think spiritual. Judah and Israel got into idolatry. And that's, God is putting this in, in, a, in a, a terms of the flesh so that we can understand his emotions. This, this is how he feels about it when, when his children go whoring after other gods. They weren't true to him. They practiced idolatry. And the names of them were Ehola, the elder. Ohola means uh, she has her own tent or tabernacle, which indicates that she didn't want anything to do with God's tabernacle. She was, had an idolatrous tabernacle. Aholah the elder, which we're going to learn is Israel, and Aholabah, which is Judah, her sister. And they were mine, the Lord speaking, verse 1, remember. They, he considered them his wives. And they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names Samaria, the capital of the ten northern tribes, Israel, is Aholah, and Jerusalem, representing Judah, is Aholabah. And Ahola played the harlot when she was mine, and she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors. And the Assyrian, of course, don't ever forget, is a type for the Antichrist. She doted and chased after their gods. Verse 6, which were clothed with blue. Oh, we're looking royalty here. Captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. They were good-looking rascals. I couldn't help but think about they're going to be just like the Nephilim are going to be good-looking rascals too. Beware of the angels. Verse 7, Thus she committed her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all her idols, she defiled herself. Ahola, meaning she has her own tent. It wasn't God's tent. She went looking for other tabernacles, other gods to worship. Verse 8, Neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt, for in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the breast of her virginity and poured their whoredom upon her. Moffat gets even more graphic in his translation of this verse. If you have a Moffat Bible, check it out. Verse 9, Wherefore I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers. You want them? You've got them. Into the hand of the Assyrians, uh, upon whom she doted. And of course, this is referring to the captivity 
beware, my beloved, though, there is another captivity coming. It's the captivity of Antichrist. God is upset with Ahola here because she's spiritually in bed with the gods of the Assyrians. He's going to look upon those who are spiritually in bed with Antichrist the same way. Verse 10, these, the Assyrians, discovered or exposed her nakedness. They took her sons and her daughters and slew her with the sword. And she became famous, more likely infamous, among women, for they had executed judgment upon her, their own severe judgment, referring to the Assyrians. And she became a warning to others. And when her sister Aholabah, this is Judah, saw this, she was more corrupt, more depraved in her inordinate love than she, referring to Ahola or Israel, and in her whoredoms more than her sister in whoredoms. 200 years later, Judah would also go into captivity, this time to the Babylonians, another type for the Antichrist. But in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, we learn that God divorced Israel, and Judah saw it and played the harlot as well. Verse 12, she, referring to Judah, doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, their gods, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, who is speaking, remember, verse 1, the Lord is speaking, that they took both one way. Both Israel and Judah went the wrong way. And that she increased her whoredoms, for when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans, it's the Babylonians, Chaldee being the dialect they spoke, portrayed with vermilion. This is bright red. They look so religious in their bright red robes. Bright red, red robes, beloved, don't mean truth is being taught there. Go to a church that teaches truth, not where they wear bright red robes, but never get around to teaching truth. Verse 15, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads. They look so religious all of them princes to look to, after the manner of the Babylonians and of Chaldee, the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them, she wanted them, and sent messengers unto them into Chaldee. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love. Again, God putting this to where we can understand it, this is his emotions. The idolatry, he's saying being in bed with the Babylonians, again, some will be in bed with Antichrist. And they defiled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. This means loosed or disjointed, the alienated. They broke off relations, in other words. And she discovered her whoredoms and discovered her nakedness, then my mind, God speaking, was alienated from her, like as my mind was alienated from her sister, from Ahola, uh, representing Israel, in other words. He divorced Israel. Verse 19. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. Verse 20, for she doted upon their paramours, this means illicit lovers or a mistress, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses and whose issue is like the issue of horses, chasing false gods and false religions. Thus thou calledest to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth and bruising thy teats by the Egyptians, for the paps of thy youth and your young virginity. And you know, 
Jesus, when he returns, he's going to be looking for virgins. Unfortunately, many are not going to be virgins. Their virginity is going to be taken by the Antichrist. Verse 22, Therefore, O Aholabah, representing Judah, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring them against thee on every side, going into captivity. The Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekod and Shoah and Koah, and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. And they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons and wheels, and with an assembly of people, which shall set against thee buckler and shield, and helmet round about, and I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments. I hope you have your gospel armor on at that point. 25, and I will set my jealousy, he is a jealous God. What is it? Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. God says, you'll have no other gods before me because my name is Jealous, capital J. Set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy nose. They're going to cut off your nose and thine ears. It won't be so good looking and attractive to those who might be wanting to commit idolatry with you in the future. And thy remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by the fire. They're going to clean you out. Just like the Assyrians cleaned out Israel, the Babylonians cleaned out Judah. Verse 26, they shall also strip thee out of thy clothes, naked as some will be in the eternity. And take away thy fair jewels, not so good looking when you're not decked out in your fine jewels. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee, and thy whoredoms brought from the land of Egypt, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. You know, God brought Israel out of Egypt. They brought their whoredoms with them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver thee into the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hand of them from whom thy mind is alienated. After the Assyrians and the Babylonians abuse you and cut off your nose and your ears, I'm going to continue to let them just have their way with you. And they shall deal with thee hatefully, and shall take away all thy labor and shall leave thee naked and bare. And the nakedness of thy whoredom shall be discovered, both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. Looking forward to the apostasy prophetically uh, and the coming of spurious Messiah. I will do these things unto thee, because thou hast gone a-whoring after the heathen, and because thou art polluted with their idols, with their religions and their gods, small g. Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, referring to Israel. Therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, we learn that this cup is the cup of God's wrath. They're going to drink it and all of it. Thus saith the Lord God, thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup deep and large. This means you're going to drink it all, even the dregs. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn, and had in derision, it containeth much. God is angry. That cup of wrath is full of his anger. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation. He's called the desolator in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And the cup of thy sister Samaria, the capital of Israel. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, 
and thou shalt break the sherds thereof and pluck off thine own breasts. This means to destroy the occasions for their idolatry in the past. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Some of them will be praying for mountains to fall on them when they realize what they have done. Sat in their life, all their life, in churches, in church pews. The preacher never got around to teaching God's word. They thought they were set for the eternity. And come to find out, they've been deceived. They will be praying for mountains to fall on them. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 35, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me, and cast me behind thy back, therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. And I can hear some that have sat in a pew all their lives. Well, we wouldn't ever do that. Oh, on the high Sabbath, when we're supposed to be celebrating Christ, our Passover, what are they doing? They're off rolling Easter eggs, as the heathen do. You think God's going to be happy with them when he returns and he finds them spiritually in bed with the Antichrist? Of course not. He's not going to be any happier with them than these who are spiritually in bed with the Assyrian and the Babylonians. These are examples for our learning. Let's go to the New Testament. Christ taught on this subject in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, many of you are familiar with that chapter beginning with the uh, ten virgins that, you know, we were talking about Israel and Judah being the bride of God and that's how he looks upon them. Well, there's a marriage in the future. Some are not going to be invited to the wedding. That's what the, the teaching of the ten virgins is. Then that followed in chapter 25. We're going to begin with verse 31, by the way. But then, following that, you have the servants of God that he gave gifts to. Remember the first, he gave five talents. The second, he gave three talents. The third, he gave one talent. And he expected return on his talents, his gifts, in other words. The first took his five and made five more. Well done, my good and faithful servant, is what God said. The second took his three and made three more. The one he gave one took it and buried it in the sand, and God was not happy with him at all. We're going to pick it up, chapter 25, verse 31, the book of Matthew. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Now that's time specific. When is it when he returns in his glory? That's at the seventh trump. The second advent begins. And all the holy angels with him, many of our relatives, will be in that army. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, King of kings, Lord of lords. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. The sheep are the overcomers. That's you, the election, who are not deceived by the Antichrist. And then shall the king, that's the Lord, say unto them on his right hand, that's the sheep, the overcomers, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. That's a Greek word most of you are familiar with. Katabol, the foundations of the world. That's Satan's rebellion, his overthrow. You, the elect, earned a right to be partakers of the first resurrection that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4, 5, and 6. The teachings of Jesus Christ, verse 34, 5. For I was in hungered, and you gave me meat. How many people today are hungry, think spiritual, are hungry for the Word of God, but they're not being fed? I was thirsty. How many today 
are thirsty for the living water, but they're led the wrong way. They're led to Antichrist instead of to Christ. And you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. Naked as a jaybird without righteous acts. Uh, without God's spiritual gospel armor on, subject to be deceived by the Antichrist, not going to have a chance against the fiery darts of Satan unless they're taught to have that gospel armor on. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Many of our brothers and sisters are in a church that puts them in bondage. You can't do this. You can't do that. Christianity sets us free. Doesn't put us in prison. Then shall the righteous, that's the, the sheep, answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee? Or thirsty and gave thee drink? We don't remember doing those things for you, Lord. When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? We don't remember that. Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king, note the capital K, the Lord, shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, we have done it. Unto you have done it unto me. You talk about teaching that we are one body. That's, that's teaching that we are one body there. You see what Jesus is saying? You didn't give me meat to eat, but you gave it to one of these, your brothers and sisters who was hungry. You didn't come and set me free from prison, but by sharing the word of God, with your brothers and sisters, you set one of my brothers free. You were naked. They were naked. And you taught them that it's righteous acts that are that robe that you wear in the eternity. That they wouldn't be naked. You taught them to put on that gospel armor so they could stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Don't ever think that your righteous acts go unnoticed. They're noticed. God keeps very, very good records. And when you do his work, when you serve him, when you serve his brethren, you notice he called us all his brethren there. We receive blessings from him. Well, what about the goats? Verse 41, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, that's the goats, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, I didn't know the devil had angels. Sure you did. They're called Nephilim, the fallen angels. For I was in hunger, the words of the Lord, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. What do we learn there? We learn that the famine of the end times is not for bread. It's not for water. It's for hearing the word of God. Many fill the pews all their lives and never get fed any meat. 43. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked and you clothed me not. You didn't teach me to put on the gospel armor or that my righteous acts would make up my robe in heaven. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, it did not minister unto thee. When, when did that happen, Lord? And Lord, if we'd have known it was you, we would have helped you. That's the point. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, my brethren, in verse 40, ye did it not to me. 
share the truth, beloved, with our lost brothers and sisters. And I, and I hope you, you, you're taking this spiritually. That's the way Jesus meant it was spiritually. He wasn't talking about uh, clothes that you go at the store and, and buy to put on. He was talking about righteous acts. He wasn't actually talking about physical prison. He was talking about religions that bind us, that, that put us in bondage. You can't do this. You can't do that if you're going to belong to our church. Christianity sets you free. Share the truth with your lost brothers and sisters. 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, right into that lake of fire along with Satan and his angels, uh, but the righteous into life eternal. Again, that first resurrection promised to the overcomers, those who don't worship the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, the, power, the second death has no power over you. Why? You're good to go. You're in the eternity. You have eternal life at that point. One more scripture we're going to cover. Turn with me. You probably know where I'm going. Revelation chapter 19. There's one group that you want to be a part of in the eternity. Revelation chapter 19 verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, that means praise ye the Lord. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. All honor and glory belongs to Him. For true and righteous are His judgments. For He hath judged the great whore, this is referring to the mother of all harlots, Babylon, Sister Babylon of Revelation 17, verse 5, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, with her idolatry, leading people to Antichrist, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And again they said, Alleluia, for her smoke rose up forever and ever. We talked about the, the fire reserved for the devil and his angels. It's called the lake of fire. And they do go up in smoke forever and ever. We learn that in Psalm 37, that acrostic Psalm, verse 7, 20, and 34. Don't worry that the wicked seem like they always get ahead. They're going up like the fat of a lamb on the spit. Psst, when that fat hits the fire, it goes up in smoke forever and ever. Verse 4, and the four and twenty-four angels, the four and twenty angels, I should say, elders. Uh, this is the twelve patriarchs and, arcs and the twelve apostles, I believe. And the four beasts, this is the zun and the zoi in, in the Hebrew language, fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia, of a truth praise ye the Lord. And a voice came out of the throne, from the throne, in other words, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, you that revere him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and a voice of many waters. We learn in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, what the waters are. The waters are the people. You have to understand the symbology or you'll never understand the book of Revelations. And as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, praise ye the Lord. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Omnipotent means he has unlimited authority. He is in charge. Let us be glad and rejoice. I know some of us are going to be jumping up and down at this point for joy. We can't wait for that day when he returns. Not as a babe to be crucified, but on that white war horse with that rod for correction. We're, going to be, we're saying now, come Lord Jesus, come. When we see him coming, we are going to be jumping up and down for joy. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Not everyone will be fit. Unfortunately, all too many are going to be spiritually in bed, just as Ahola and Aholibah 
were spiritually in bed with the Assyrians and the Babylonians are going to be spiritually in bed with the Antichrist. The bride of, of the Lord, Hepzibah, is her name. My delight is in her in the Hebrew. And to her was granted, this is the bride of the Lord, she should be arrayed in fine linen and white. She's going to be clothed. She's not going to be naked. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Righteous acts make up your linen, your robe, so that you won't be naked. Do you have a, a long, nice, long white robe lined up for you? Have you got one reserved? Or are you going to be naked as a jaybird? And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper. In other words, not everyone's invited. Some are not fit. Why? Because they're not a virgin bride. Called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet, John speaking, to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. The angel responded to John, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. In other words, worship God, not me. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Again, not a babe in swaddling clothing, this time sent to the earth to be crucified for our sins. He's going to be making war. First comes the war, then the wedding. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. All the crowns of earth mel melted into one. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. How many times have you heard pastors at Shepherd's Chapel say, Jesus, the living Word? That's what this is referring to, the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed, not naked, they were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that sharp two-edged sword of chapter 1 verse 16, his tongue, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, that cup that Ahola and Aholabah were forced to partake of. Uh, those who do not overcome will take of that wrath, that cup as well. Verse 16 to conclude. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's at that point in time where the sheep will be separated over to his right side and the goats separated to his left side. And what did it say about the sheep? How blessed they are. And you are blessed because you are election. You know, we have work to do here. This is not a free ride. God ha expects us to work for him. He knows that there are many of his, his brethren that are hungry. They're hungry for the word of God. So when you support a ministry that teaches the hungry, the word of God. When you help get a newsletter out that, that teaches our brothers and sisters the word of God, those are righteous acts. Those are things that won't be forgotten by your father. And they do make up that white robe. Hopefully, each and every one of us has a long white one that we can go into the eternity with. You know, I, I, I see what other ministries are doing and I know God takes notice and blesses this ministry. Uh, he's given us awesome gifts. He's given us op awesome opportunities. Let's not let him down.
Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father, and it is indeed a pleasure to serve you, Father. Uh, let everything that we do the rest of this day be to the, the honor and glory of thy name, in Jesus' precious name. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. The dead uh, is evil. And you make a prime example in God's word when uh, Saul was trying to summons up the spirit of Samuel who was deceased through a familiar spirit, uh, the witch of Ender, as you pointed out so readily. Now, there are uh, television programs on too that uh, try and make a buck uh, off of this 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 process of speaking to the dead, but again, it's evil. It's wicked. You want to separate yourself from it. Uh, and any Christian that gets involved in this kind of stuff is rolling the dice with Satan. I'll guarantee you. So uh, rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, if your friends want to get off in that, and you. Uh, try and correct them by pointing out in God's word that God looks upon it as evil. Uh, you've done your part. You've, you've planted that seed of truth, as you mentioned. So, uh, but you yourself uh, stay away from that. Uh, the, the, the term familiar spirit, uh, take it back in your strong. It means necromancer, which means uh, a ventriloquist. In other words, what does a ventriloquist do? A ventriloquist pretends that a piece of wood with some clothing on it sitting on his knee can talk. And that's exactly what these people who try and summons up uh, an evil spirit. They're pretending that they can speak for the person who's deceased. Uh, it's evil. It's wicked. Stay away from it. Robert uh, says KC. I don't know if that means Kansas City or where, but you know where you're from. Could you please tell me if the programs viewed on the weekends are live programs? No, uh, on Shepherd's Chapel Network, if you're watching on the weekends, what you'll see are a variety of programming. <clears throat> Again, though, it depends on how you watch. If you're, and I guess probably you're watching on Dish Network because that's about the only means you have other than the internet of the video of the C-band or C-band satellite would be another alternative that you could get it on the weekends. But you get a variety of programming, either documentaries, uh, replays of Sunday messages past, uh, things of that nature. Buddy in South Carolina, and I guess that might be a good opportunity for me, too, to, to let those of you who have C-band satellite, the older, and I don't want to confuse anyone. If you're on Dish Network, DirecTV, what I'm about to say does not apply to you. This only applies to those who have the older, bigger satellite systems known as C-band satellite. And beginning on August 1st, uh, we will be broadcasting our programming uh, in high definition. Uh, we mailed out a letter last week, which many of you will be getting in the next day or two if you haven't already gotten it, uh, announcing this. And the picture is excellent. You're really going to be pleased. But there is a requirement, and that is you have to replace the box on top of your television with a digital box. Now what you want to do is go to your satellite uh, provider, 
or get on the internet and, and find a digital box, but then what you do is, and there's a little bit of expense, you're gonna have to purchase a new digital box, uh, but then you put it on top of your TV and in place of your old box, hook up your satellite, hook up your TV, and you're gonna have high definition. In fact, you'll have three channels of high definition. Uh, by the way, on weekends, through July, we will be uh, broadcasting in high def, so if you purchase this equipment, you can hook it up, and on the weekends, you'll be able to test uh, the high definition picture before the actual implementation date, which again is August 1st. Again, when you, if you have questions, please don't call the chapel. Take your letter that we're sending to you or print off from the internet the information, the technical data. Take it to your satellite equipment provider. Obtain a digital box. Hook it up to your satellite. Hook it up to your TV and you'll have high definition beginning August 1st. Buddy in South Carolina, Pastor Dennis, I was asked to ask you if Matthew 7, 6 means give the bread to the dogs and I feed my dogs from the table. Is this a correct? Uh, giving the bread to the dogs in Matthew 7 has nothing to do with you feeding uh, your canine at home. Uh, it's a spiritual meaning. You don't uh, give the bread of God's word to the dogs. You don't cast your pearls before swine. And it's uh, symbology. It's not talking about actual bread or pearls. It means don't waste God's word on people who don't care. And I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know, it makes his day when he looks down and he sees you studying the letter he wrote to you. He loves you for it and blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important, beloved, and it's this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus Yeshua, our Messiah, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.